Hi guys, look I usually start off my videos with a bit of a joke, a bit of a chirpy intro. I'm not going to do that on this video. This is serious. Um, I want to show you an image, I want to kick off this video with an image and this isn't just any image. I'm going to show you an image of what is possibly the most evil thing that has ever been shown. So if you have a, if you have a nervous disposition, really probably best not to watch the rest of this video, best to switch off now. Okay, if you're still watching, grab yourself a seat, perhaps grab yourself a stiff drink. Here's the image. Okay, look, I, I did warn you before I showed you that image, but I, I still feel the need to apologise for that. There's probably no reason, no justification to show you an image quite as evil as that. I promise I won't show you that image again. What I am going to show you is an image that, that's that's less evil than that one, just so that we can compare the two images. So let's have a look at the second slide. Okay, well look, if you're reaching for the phone right now to call the men in white coats on the grounds that you're watching some slap-headed bloke on YouTube who's finally become totally unhinged from reality, there's no need to worry. Although we'd probably have become totally unhinged from reality after three or four years on YouTube dealing with these kinds of, of topics. But that's not the problem here. What I'm talking about here is the problem of evil, of course. And in this instance, a particular solution that is often attributed to St. Augustine in the 4th and 5th century, quite a, quite a long time ago. What St. Augustine and others were trying to reconcile was how a good God, how a benevolent God, could have created evil. Well, this particular solution, this particular idea is that God didn't create evil at all. That evil is an absence or a privation of good. So what we're being asked to entertain here is that the relationship between good and evil is an asymmetrical one. It's a little bit like the relationship between light and darkness. Darkness is simply an absence of light. It's an absence of photons. If there's no light in the room, you have darkness. But darkness isn't a tangible thing in itself in the same way that light is. Now the whole purpose of making this argument, of course, is to get God off the hook and of course it does get God off the hook because what we're being told is that God only created good and evil is simply what's left behind when there's none of God's lovely goodness infusing the situation but this does lead to a few problems I think I've already demonstrated what one of the problems were if this is the definition that we're going to go by then an empty universe would be the most evil thing that you could possibly have there is nothing that you could add in that universe that would make it any more evil because evil is simply an absence of good it's just like darkness there's nothing that you can do to make darkness any darker but the end result of this is that if we take an empty universe and insert, inject Hitler into that universe with all the things that he stood for, all his thoughts, all his opinions, we actually make the universe less evil than it was before. There's no aspect of Hitler that could make it any worse, but everybody is at least a shred of goodness within them. So the only thing that adding a Hitler could possibly do would to be, be to make that universe less evil. Well, that isn't the only problem we have if we accept that evil is simply the absence of good. To demonstrate why that is, let's take the example of temperature and of heat energy, which is another asymmetric system. Okay, so here on our temperature scale, we start at 0 Kelvin, and as the amount of heat energy increases, uh, so the temperature increases. It's all pretty standard stuff. At 273.15 Kelvin, that's a bit of a special place because we've got another scale, the Celsius scale, and that's the zero point on that Celsius scale. Of course, that's an arbitrarily arrived at zero point. It doesn't really mean anything. It's just a point chosen because it fitted in with everyday things, in this case, the freezing point of water. But when we now look at good and evil, there's another point, there's another zero point that we need to make but it's not quite as arbitrary in this case. This is the point of neutrality, where we stop classing things as evil and we start classing them as good. But the question then becomes, how much good do we have to put in this system, in this universe, before it stops being evil and starts being good? 
So this is a second problem that we've arrived at with this idea that evil is simply an absence of good. And at this point, I would be quite within my rights to stop this video and say this just shows what a totally absurd uh, way of dealing with evil that this really is. But I don't want to do that on this occasion. I started to think outside the box on this. And I've been reading a little bit about Christian science. So I thought, why don't I try and adopt a bit of Christian science of my own and see if I can formulate some way of making this theory work. So this is how I've got on. Of course, one of the great things about using Christian science is that we don't have to get weighed down with the usual baggage of testability, of falsifiability, evidence. In fact, one of the great things about Christian science is that we don't have to include any science. All we have to do is come up with something which, if it were true, would answer the problem that we need to answer. So my starting point then is to propose that God has permeated the entire universe with a goodness field of just the right strength to balance out the inherent evilness of the universe to create universal neutrality. Now, what's this, what's this goodness field going to be measured in? Well, it's going to be measured in whole hours. And if you don't know what a whole hour is, think about it. Whenever anybody talks about a good act, what's the standard archetypical act of goodness? Well, it's helping an old lady across the road. So these are our units. And our standard unit of, of goodness is going to be helping a single old lady across the road on a single occasion. So now we've got our units for the field, the next question becomes how strong does this field have to be? Well one thing we do know is that it needs to be at least strong enough as to permit somebody such as Adolf Hitler to be as evil as he was. Now, I'm doing a few field calculations. These may not be entirely accurate, but let's give it a bit of a go. By my reckoning, if Adolf Hitler was to have escorted an old lady across the road uh, every minute for his entire life, that would probably have balanced out the evil that he committed. If we assume an average human volume of 0 0.07 cubic metres, which is for about a 70 kilogram human being, we punch the numbers in there and we arrive at a field strength of 0 0.238 whole hours per second per cubic meter. So let's incorporate now this whole hour field of just the right field strength back into our empty universe and see what happens. So there you go, you can now see that our empty universe is infused with this goodness of the whole hour field in such a way that it exactly balances out the inherent evilness that would be present in an empty universe. So the big question now is, what will happen if we reintroduce Hitler into this empty universe? Well, what I don't think will happen is what you see now. What I actually propose is something more along the lines of what Einstein talked about when he talked about what happens when you introduce mass, how it distorts space-time, and that's what we experience as gravity. I hope you can graphically see what's going on here. The hollow field has been repelled, leaving a Hitler-shaped region of very, very low field density. And this is exposing the underlying evil of the fabric of the universe. Now, maybe I'm biased, but this seems to me to be one of the best bits of Christian science research that's been conducted in decades. It certainly seems to knock into a cocked hat anything that the Discovery Institute has managed to cobble together. But I realise that your mileage may vary. Some of you might not be quite as convinced about this as I am. You might actually think that this is a whole load of old bullshit. So to combat that and to make sure that everybody can take this seriously, I also want to propose that God has infused the universe with an anti-bullshit field. And whilst I freely admit that I haven't gone as far as to calculate the exact strength of that field yet, what I do know is that it'll be just strong enough and no more as to counteract the slight aroma that's come off the last three or four minutes of video. Okay, so so ends my little dabbling there in the world of Christian science, an attempt to back up not just St. Augustine, but also you'll find Christians today who make up the same, who use the same argument that uh, evil isn't a thing in itself, that it's the absence of good and that good is a thing in itself and that God is only responsible for the good. Evil is just what's left. 
But what about this, this hypothesis that I've given you? Is it testable? Well, no. Is there any evidence for it? No. Is it falsifiable? No. The only reason that you would have to believe in it is the grounds of faith. Have we heard that somewhere before? Thanks for watching this video and bye for now.